I'm Isaac, and you're listening to the Bacon Bits and Bytes podcast. This is the podcast where a bit of business and a bite of technology come together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bacon Bits and Bites podcast. I'm super excited today to have Arena Mogul on the show. She is an award-winning entrepreneur that has been featured in CBC, Flare, and Polygon. Arena is the CEO of Beam.gg, a Canadian tech startup that's looking to build software for the esports and gaming industries. Prior to Beam.gg, Arena worked as a consultant for the world's first esports theme park, had her first esports startup acquired, and worked for the Region Appeal for over five years. Welcome to the show. Hi, Karen. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's been a long time coming, and I can't wait. <laughs> I know. I'm really excited to have you on the show. I have so many questions, but let's first get started with um, your childhood. Were you always into video games, and what were some of your favorite video games as a kid? Yeah, so I was always into video games, unfortunately, to my parents. So uh, some of the favorite games that I had played during my childhood would be, you know, the typical Game Boy um, Pokemon series. Uh, I also really like Red Alert, um, which is the real-time strategy game. Um, And then uh, also things like Gunbound and RPGs like Ragnarok. Like those are uh, basically I delved into a lot of different games Mm -hmm. when I was Uh a kid. Well, uh, this this kind of dates me because the Game Boy games I liked, I think it was when Game Boy first came out. So I remember playing like Tetris and then Kirby's Dream Land. And then with <laughs> respect to Nintendo, it was, I think, the first system that came out where you had to like blow into the cart- cartridge. And I remember playing like Duck Hunt and then like the power pad, like jumping up and down at my cousin's house. And then even the fighting games, such as a uh, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. So you did a lot of playing video games. Did you also watch other people play video games as a kid? I did, but it was not as what you think it would be today. Back when I was a kid, I used to watch, you know, other family members and relatives play at our house or, or at their house when I'm visiting. But I also, when I was in high school, I did uh, go to internet cafes and watched other people play video games, mostly because, you know, I wanted to learn how they were able to, um, you know, become like a legendary status in, in that specific game that they're playing. And also it was really good seeing them play because I saw how they were playing based on the placements of their fingers on the keyboard. That's really interesting. It's like you actually studied how they um, played video games because I, I think I just watched it just for the sake of like entertainment to see all like the cool moves that they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, you know, up my game as well. So I definitely asked um, a lot of questions as well. Like, hey, how, how were you able to do this? What key did you press or what's the seconds or the minutes that's required to execute a certain type of move? Wow, that's really cool because, you know, with the the fighting games in Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, I know there are a series of key combinations, but I never bothered to learn them. I just basically would press as many buttons as I could, (laughs) as fast as I could, and then kind of hope for the best. (laughs) Yeah, usually, I mean games are for fun right it's for entertainment so you know not everyone needs to learn all the combos like if you're having fun pressing and smashing the buttons I mean that's cool so I took a look at your LinkedIn profile and then prior to being part of the esports startup world you were a social worker so what made you decide to I guess have it become a side hustle and then also what made you decide to launch your first esports startup daily esports Yeah, so um, when I was in school, I took up social sciences. um, And the reason why I did that is because that is one of my passions, or that is my core passion, that it's the principle that I've kind of built my life upon. um, And that's to help people. 
as a new immigrant, as a new Filipino immigrant into Canada, uh, I was thinking, huh, how do I help people? And uh, the first thing that, that, that was the most obvious was, you know, become a social worker and specialize in the immigrant and refugee settlement stream. So that is what I did in school. And as soon as I graduated, I took a job with the Region of Peel a week later. I did get an offer for an interview with the City of Toronto, but I was living living in Peel at the time. So it just made more sense to go with the region of Peel offer. So that's when that was in 2009. Um, and then I've been there and then I, I was working on also my startup daily esports during my time at Peel. So it was my height side hustle as you can call it uh, during my uh, caseworker, social worker days there. Mm -hmm. And then it was acquired um, by, by another company. And was that the end goal for Daily Esports? Uh, yes, um, because my passion was really tech and business. Daily Esports was focused on a lot of content and media. It wasn't something that I was looking to build and grow over the years. Um, I wanted to, you know, expand the different experiences and skills that I had. And I did that through daily esports. And when the opportunity to, uh, you know, fly overseas and uh, work on a theme park was, you know, something that I didn't want to um, uh, pass on. So I did that right after. Yeah, that actually brings me to the next question in that uh, you were a consultant for that first esports theme park. And it, it just it just blows my mind to think that somebody would come up with that kind of idea. Because, you know, when we think of theme parks, we, we have like our local one Canada's Wonderland and then there's like Disney World and Disneyland. What is an esports theme park? How would you describe it? So an esports theme park does have a couple of different um, offerings. Some of them are a space for people to play video games, a space for people to watch people playing video games, a space for people to create content of people playing video games. There's space for retail, for uh, companies to sell their products to people who um, play video games or their families or their friends. Um, there's also, you know, obviously F and B um, people need to be energized and should be able to, you know, buy food and drinks close by other parts of it could be experiential type of activities like racing, escape rooms, you know, ax throwing to board games. Another part of it could be arcades. So, people playing old school type of arcades. So it gives that nostalgic feeling to it. Um, it could also be an offering where there's a museum of different types of video games that's been done in the past, published or produced in the past could be in there as well. So it's a, it's a mixed bag because you can also have co-working spaces there as well. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So with respect to beam.gg, like, when you were first starting that, like because you already had experience building a startup da daily esports, what did you find the the process much more seamless, or did you still feel you encountered a lot of obstacles when you first started a few years ago? I mean, it did make the process a bit more streamlined, but I would say only by five percent. Okay. So nothing like too <laughs> significant where you know I started this whole company in the same industry and like I found success much quicker. Definitely not like that. It just helped with, you know, being in tune with a space that helped a lot. So it wasn't as if I was speaking to people in the industry with the new product and they knew that I had, you know, knowledge and domain expertise in the industry versus if I didn't, um, then it would be like a different conversation. But yeah, like I would say only really helped by 5% you know, having the other startup just because it, it didn't focus on the same thing, even though it's in the same industry. Right. So you still felt like you were kind of starting all over again, but not, I guess, completely from ground zero. Yeah. So I remember uh, attending like Fan Expo in Toronto a few years ago. I remember that they had a live esports competition and I was just blown away by how many people were in attendance why do you think competitive gaming is so popular and you know what what are some factors that have led to it becoming a billion dollar industry 
I believe the number one factor is accessibility. So anyone from any race, any age, any city, any weather can participate in esports in some sort of way because it is digital and because most of the content is free. So if you wanted, let's just say, if you wanted to watch the NBA, you usually need, do need cable um, subscription, pay-per-view. You have to go to either a bar or to the actual game itself to watch it. For esports, um, it's free. So it's free on Twitch or it's free on YouTube or it's free on Mixer. And uh, it's just less barriers for people to cross over. However, if you do want to attend an esports, a major esports tournament, you know, in person, then that 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 does cost some money. Um, but otherwise, you can watch it for free in HD um, online. And the fact that you know, once you see someone make a move, it will take you seconds to try and do that move in game. You could just open up your game and see if it works for you. <laughs> um, so this accessibility is the number one thing. And just the connectivity with a lot of the different players, you know, um, you know, they don't see what you look like, who you are, but you have a goal. When you load into a game, you have this goal, you have this uh, team that you need to work with for that game to reach this specific goal so that you can win. And that is one of the quickest ways to build camaraderie and trust between people. And I think there's no better way in doing that except for, you know, playing a video game. So how does one get into competitive gaming if they say, they just make that decision, okay, I'm you know, I want to take it to the next level from casual gaming to, uh, to taking it more seriously. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's exactly what you do. So you're playing a video game, you think that, you know, you can make it big, and you can play really well, you're very skilled. And, you know, you're not, you're better than all of your friends, you're better than everyone that you meet in public games. Now, the next thing is you reach out to the teams and you reach out to coaches or managers and tell them that, hey, I want to try out for your team. Naturally in games, there's calibration. So let's just say that I'm a professional player and you, Karen, you started to play this game and you got really good at it. So you write, you rose up the ranks. And in games, there's calibration, like I said, where you are matched with someone of a similar skill. Because then games would not be fun if you matched with someone who is much lower in skill level than you. Um, so you do get matched with similarly skilled level players. So once you both get into a game, um, for example, I, I'm a pro player and you're this rising star, um, but you're unknown. Like nobody knows you. And we get into a game. You, I could absolutely see how you play and then be impressed with it and ask you, hey, are you in a team? And vice versa. You could see my name and uh, it could be very obvious that I'm a pro player because of like a game name or whatsoever, a game tag. And you can ask me to, you know, to see if like you can try out for my team. There's communities, semi-professional communities, professional communities for esports players where they can join tryouts, they can compete with other high-skilled players, and then the coaches or the managers or the team owners determine if they want to get you inside the team. So it's it, the accessibility, like I said, is very, very, very good in esports. Almost anyone can be a pro player as long as you're very high-skilled. Oh, cool. Uh, so prior to attending your, your launch party, I had no idea that there were several other people behind the scenes, as you had mentioned, managers, coaches, team owners. It is like a professional sport, like it is a professional sports league. Um, so where would you find like managers, coaches, team owners? Again, it's like uh, reaching out to people in those communities. Yeah, so there's a lot. Social media, Twitter is the best platform for gamers. A lot of gamers are on it, both casual to pro and teams as well. Reddit is another way 
because they also do have sometimes they do have amateur type of events as well and that's kind of how you start so playing a video game and matching up and connecting and getting matched with other players that's great but if you want to take your skill to the next level then you want to start to get into private matches private matches are taken more seriously um so for example let's say dota 2 and i think it's better to kind of explain it this way so dota 2 is a video game it's a massively online battle arena and um it's a 5v5 so five players versus another five players you get matched into the game and you win points and with points you get points based on you know how you win and how skilled the other opponent is with these points it gets you trophies so it's kind of like a nice way to kind of humble brag to people that hey you have a high trophy so you're a high school player but that's not really how you can become pro directly so another way would be you start going on reddit or discord or twitter and looking for amateur events you'll quickly realize that you are a very skilled player if you're able to win the tournaments and you know not giving any wins to your opponents and then you move up to you know semi pro events and then you start getting interest from tier four, tier three teams, and then you'll also quickly realize how well you play in that type of scene and in that type of level. And then you just keep on going up, up the way to tier one type of team. Um, you can also grind. Grinding in esports is kind of, or gaming is like where you keep on playing until you get a lot of points and you're the number one player in the world for this game. So you could do that as well. And when you do that, of course, everyone's eyes are going to be on you and you're going to be messaged by coaches, by recruiters, etc., cetera, uh, to play for them. How often would you say a professional gamer on average uh, practices? They do practice a lot. Um, that is one of the issues in esports where they do practice for a very long time. You know, in sports, when you practice, you can't really practice for 16 hours straight. Your body just won't allow it, right? Because there's physical hindrances and you can't do that every day for like months at a time. But esports players do. They practice anywhere from 12 to 16 hour days every single day and they do that for months. And sometimes when there's a big tournament coming up, what they do is they practice, you know, 16 hour days every single day up until the tournament. So that's kind of like how the player schedule looks like wow that's that's dedication to spend that oh, much yeah. time <laughs> practicing for a tournament what are some popular misconceptions people have about esports and for me again before i knew about the industry i just assumed it was more of an isolated hobby and then the only i don't even know if this could be considered an esport or a, a gaming type game i i remember some of my friends playing world of warcraft back in the day but i i guess now i played that, that too <laughs> oh i never played i just heard of it they called it wow um but yeah. now i know the the games that are being played are call of duty and fortnite league of legends and again just going back to my question what do you think are some of the popular misconceptions and like why do you think people have these misconceptions misconceptions about uh what in particular just about like esports i guess in in general like perhaps uh -huh. maybe not seeing it as a, a legitimate type of sport Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this has been a, an ongoing discussion. Um, and I do completely understand actually from both sides of the argument, you know, from sports and also from esports. Personally, in my own personal opinion, I think esports should be more modeled towards entertainment, like music and movies. For sports, it's completely different. Um, I think the competitiveness is the reason why people called it esports. But apart from the competitiveness, from people playing video games to people watching it and all of that, it's very similar. And even the content produced and rights and licenses, it's very much more similar to movies and music. And I say this because, for example, if you filmed yourself playing basketball, you don't necessarily have to pay the inventor of basketball royalties, right? But if you filmed yourself playing League of Legends or Fortnite and you televised it on cable TVs, on Times Square and all of that, 
you're going to have a pretty big problem in your hands because the content that you're showing off is owned by the publisher. So that's the kind of like the main difference between the two. And I think that's a very big misconception for a lot of people. Um, another one is that these are just basement dwellers, fat people who are playing video games, et cetera, et cetera, should not be included in Olympics or, you know, there's a lot of discussions around that. And I think it's because when esports started to get a lot of mainstream attention, people were quick to put a lot of different labels on it. And I think that kind of, that is the stem of the, and root of the problem. But I think now there's been progress. I, I do think that there's been progress and people understanding esports from both sides of the fence. Traditional sports professionals, traditional media professionals now understand the industry more. And then uh, the gamers, uh, you know, the hardcore passionate gamers on the other side are also understanding where, you know, traditional sports and media people are coming from because when we think about it the average esports enthusiast the esports fan spends like six to seven dollars a year on esports while an nfl fan spends 60 to 70 dollars and that's just only for one sport so the industry itself still has a very long way to go but i think just knowing and learning more about the industry and not being quick to judge or not being quick to put labels i think will go a long way because that's mostly where all the misconceptions came from yeah for sure education definitely makes a difference prior mm-hmm. to the interview i was reading an article on ccn excuse me ccn.com that mentioned a uh, greater Southeast Asia is projecting a huge amount of growth in the esports market and that China, Japan, Korea, and the U.S. are considered to be the dominant players. So do you foresee Canada making a name for themselves in this industry in the near future? So it's happening. It's happening in Canada and there's a lot more projects that's going on behind the scenes that I can't really talk about and very big major projects as well. So I would really call on brands, people, companies who want to, you know, explore the industry and maybe see if it makes sense for them to sell or to promote or to provide their services and products to the industry. I think it's a worthwhile effort for them, for any company, actually. I'm just curious to know, there are are several esports teams out there in in Toronto. Do you have a favorite esports team you know is there one that you like you cheer for <laughs> you're you're a big fan of <laughs> i'm not gonna say it oh, okay <laughs> i i love all the teams and if i pick one team i think my head's gonna be on the chopping block oh, okay. because we're friends you know i'm friends yeah. with all of the people here so i don't want to play favorites but they're all doing a really phenomenal amount of work of effort of time into the toronto esports scene so i'm really glad that we have all of those things happening in our city okay maybe you can answer this question do you have a favorite esport game like is it fortnite league of legends dota So I played all the games, but I do have to say that my favorite video game is Dota. Not because the other games are lesser in terms of entertainment. They're all very, very fun games. So I played StarCraft. I played WoW. I played Fortnite, Apex Legends. The thing is, I like Dota 2 because it's where I found my fiance. (laughs) So we met through Dota 2, yes. The reason why I also love it is because um, it really challenges me. It's always different. I don't play it often or as much as I want to play Dota 2, but I do play it once in a while. And when I do, there's always new things to learn. Um, It's a very difficult game to learn and teamwork is amazing in the game. Um, And I do have a lot of friends that play it. So naturally I would enjoy playing Dota 2 more than the other games because then I know the people, like some of the people that I play with, I've known them for five, 10 years. So it just makes the experience even better. Awesome. I want to shift back to Beam.gg itself. And in one sentence, it could be described as helping brands and organizations enter and thrive in esports and i was looking on the sites and it showed that you've worked with some organizations such as like york university and mccarthy uh tetra and 
those are the type of organizations, I guess, they don't naturally come to mind with respect to um, esports. So I'm just curious to know, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners are curious to know, how does esports like get incorporated in those types of brands? So there's a lot of different ways. I think a, a lot of people, and it's a very big misconception as well, where they think, okay, you're an esports company, so you're only going to serve gaming companies or like not even gaming, but only esports companies like teams. And I think, you know, without sharing, of course, our secret sauce and how we built our business and our business model, I think what a lot of people have to do is think outside the box. When you think about esports, it's competitive gaming, it's gamifying the esports experience, and it appeals to millennials. It appeals to younger people who have been historically very evasive to traditional ads and to traditional uh, media. So if you're able to outreach or serve clients who want to outreach to those type of customer groups, then I think you should definitely look into esports and seeing what kind of products and services exist, how you can complement them. And if you see that there's a gap in an offering, then it's a great way to expand your business or to create a new business. So as a female CEO in a male dominated industry such as esports, what has that experience been like? And do you foresee more women entering the space in the future? I definitely hope so. And it's one of my goals and my values to do that, to get more women in leadership positions. One of the very big misconceptions, which gets me riled up <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> is when people tell me that, hey, there's not enough women. And to me, that just seems like you've not done your homework. There's more people, there's more women that play mobile games than men. Oh, this is a fact. Also, I mean, if you look at it, you know, there's more women in the world than men as well, <laughs> like statistics wise. And there's a lot of women in esports and in gaming who work or who are passionate about the space or who want to enter the space. The unfortunate thing is most key decision makers are all male. So when that happens, um, when you see that, if you're a woman, if you don't see someone in a leadership position, how are you able to get inspired and motivate yourself to do the same thing? You can't be what you can't see. So Ooh, I like that. That's a good one. Yes. You know, I've never had this problem. Like a lot of people that I talk to, we try so hard to be diverse, etc. And for me, it's not a problem because I have a lot of women who message me and who ask me, hey, can you connect me to this person? Or, hey, I'd love to know if I can join your team. Do you think you need someone like me, et cetera, et cetera. And it's because they feel comfortable and they see me. I'm a woman and I'm a CEO of my esports company. So if you have more decision making, makers that are women in leadership positions, then a lot of those things will shift. If you are an investor and you want to invest, it a key priority that you want to invest into female founders. There's still not a lot of female founded startups that are, that are getting funding and esports is not an exemption. The obstacle there is it's really a boys club. And if you are not going to uh, make an effort into making your leadership team or at least your senior directors or VPs to be more diverse, then it's going to be an ongoing problem. That, that's a good point. Uh, in your previous response, you mentioned gaming and esports. I automatically or I, I initially assumed that they were in a cha interchangeable is there a big difference between the two, like gaming and esports? Are they two separate things? Um, I would say that, I mean, esports will not exist without gaming, of course. Gaming is gaming. You play video game, people develop, design, produce video games. And then you have esports, which is competitive gaming. I wish we actually called it competitive gaming, but esports sounded, I guess, more brandable. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But <laughs> so for esports, it's competitive gaming. So it's video games played at a competitive level from amateur to professional level. And then your different types of aspects there. So if you even compare traditional sports, basketball is the game, but the NBA would be the esports. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. So what are some predictions? technology-wise, if you have any, for the future of professional gaming? 
Absolutely. It's already happening. I know of a lot of different companies who incorporate advanced technology, us, our company being .gg included as well. So um, we've incorporated AI into our uh, products. I've also seen blockchain type of uh, products for esports. I've seen computer vision for esports. I've seen AR, VR for esports as well. So it's definitely coming. If not, it's already here. There's quite a few already exist. Definitely coming. If not, it's already here. There's quite a few already existing actually. Um, and I can't wait to see even more of it coming on board because like I said, esports is still a long way before it can become, you know, a very big mainstream industry project, etc. And uh, the way that we can do that is obviously uh, including and implementing technology to get us there as well. What is the best advice that someone has given to you regarding entrepreneurship? If you could like pass on some wisdom. Don't get carried away by what people say. (laughs) I think that is the best advice anyone could ever give me because it's still the same advice that I struggle with and that I always try to remember. So in a short line, don't get carried away by what other people say. So this kind of touches on a lot of different things. So if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you you will eventually have very motivated. If you're an entrepreneur, you know, you, you, you will eventually have very motivated entrepreneur friends and Mm -hmm. you will see their successes. And the, the thing that you have to focus on is your own business, just because other companies or other entrepreneurs are posting, Hey, I'm doing this. I'm doing that on social media. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing worse because you are your own worst critic. So you always have to be, you know, your strongest cheerleader always support yourself always I self-talk a lot like I always motivate myself um (laughs) and it's very easy for someone to feel embarrassed that they haven't secured a partnership or they haven't grown their monthly recurring revenue to 10 times x there's a lot of those things and I think it's just you know don't listen to or don't pay attention to that just focus on your goals And a lot of people, and the second part of that is an expert at what they do. And when you ask them for information, take it with a grain of salt. You know your business the most. You have the most skin in the game. When someone gives you advice, that doesn't necessarily mean they have skin in the game. So they would naturally give you the best advice that they think can work for them, but that may not work for you. So always be mindful of that. Thank you. That's really great advice on how to take advice from people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if they want to connect with you on social media and learn more about all the cool things that beam.gg is doing, where can they find you? So they can find me on Twitter, on Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, On Twitter and Instagram, I have the same handle. It's my first name, last name, Arwina Mogul, A-R-W-I-N-A-M-O-G-U-L. And then on LinkedIn, I think it's A Mogul only. So A-M-O, I think it's A Mogul only. So A-M-O-G-U-L. And you can also search me on um, on the search bar on LinkedIn. I have a very unique name. So I'm the only one in the world with the same name. So it's very easy to connect with me on social media. I know when I first saw your last name, I thought that is such a cool last name. And how fitting is it that you're, you know, an entrepreneur (laughs) and you've launched like two startups. I think that's a very cool last name. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. It's kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time. Some people think automatically think I'm this very egoistic person and think that I actually changed my last name to Mogul. Oh, really? But yeah, yeah, actually some people actually thought that. Um, And this is what I mean by don't listen to other people. (laughs) (laughs) Some people do find it very interesting that I have that last name. I, it's just something that I can part of myself actually up until I started my entrepreneurship journey when it, kind of gave meaning to my last name. So that was really cool. Actually, so speaking of meaning of the last name, is anyone else in your family an entrepreneur? No, actually. 
in my immediate family, no one is an entrepreneur. Even my grandparents, no one was an entrepreneur. So it's, it was also very difficult for me to kind of explain this whole thing to them. You, you would think that we would have entrepreneurs <laughs> in the family with a, with a family name like Mogul, right? Yeah, you're like, oh, it's uh, the Moguls. They just, you know, have so many uh, businesses, businesses out there. Businesses, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you'd think that, but no, no. <laughs> that would be cool. That would make my life easier. But no, we don't. We don't have any entrepreneurs in the family except myself. So thank you again for uh, being on the show. This is a really great conversation. And I, I learned so uh-huh. much more about this, uh-huh. so much more about the esports industry. And, and it's really open my thank eyes. You. I'm really excited to like see all the, the upcoming things that you're doing because I swear you're like everywhere. Every time I see you on social media, <laughs> here, I'm on this magazine. And, and of course, you know, uh, in a few weeks, you'll be on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm looking forward to sharing this on my social media as well. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and stay tuned for more episodes. Ciao for now. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Bacon Bits and Bites podcast. If you enjoyed the content, please subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, and share this podcast with your family and friends. You can follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Bacon Bits and Bites. And on Twitter, it's Bacon Bits underscore Bites. Ciao for now!